If I bore you, just cut me off. Anyway, <laughs> I was in Cape May for a long time. I've been here 36 years and my husband died and I needed to do something else. And first I got in, in, involved in birding and from birding you get involved in butterfly gardening because when the birds go away, the butterflies come out. So back in 2010, I had this small, very small garden with a little bit of dill and a little bit of parsley and some flowers. And so I planted the parsley and the dill because it's a host for black swallowtail. Here, you see the mating black swallowtails right here. And then after they mate, they lay eggs and they have these little tiny, excuse me, caterpillars, which are called first instars. And they eat and grow and eat and grow. And you'll see here, they have grown a lot. So this is a caterpillar that's probably ready to go into a chrysalis, um, which is, a, um, you've re heard it referred to as a um, pupa or a cocoon. We had invasive trees along the edge of our property called autumn olive that had escaped and gone everywhere. So I had to have them um, taken out and their roots ground out. So in 2010, I had four butter, five butterfly species that I saw. A black swallowtail, a cabbage white, gray hair streak monarchs, and orange sulfurs. And I've listed their host plants there because as they record this, you can go back and look at it and if you want any information, it'll be there. Or I can send you a PFD of the program. So in the spring of 2011, this truck came and brought me a load of Terragro. And Terragro is a, a mixture of old leaves, old trees that have decayed. It's, it's a, I don't know if you can see the makeup of it. I cannot right now to read it to you. Um, oh, yes. You, you buy it from your county and they come and dump it for you. So we moved all that dirt. We put a small garden in the front and then we built part of a berm in the backyard along the edge of the property and added some dirt to that center garden. So this is in August and we've added the dirt and it was wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow and put some flowers in. And then we watered it. Now I keep plants in the containers until they're ready to plant. I do all the watering by hand or use the sprinklers. Um, that year we saw pussy toes. Uh, we saw lady American ladies, I'm sorry, on pussy toes, which is their host plant. So I don't know this left-hand picture right here. I don't know if you can see the caterpillars in there or not, but they make these little nests. And here's a caterpillar that's coming out of the nest. Um, and they come out to feed. And um, as they get older, they come out. And can you see my pointer when I'm showing something? Yes. Okay. So here is a chrysalis. That's what the caterpillar went into. Before it becomes a butterfly. So this chrysalis, the, this American lady butterfly has just come out of this chrysalis and when they come out their wings are wet so they need to dry their wings so they actually come out they're all curled up and they pump liquid into their wings and um, dry them off and they're able to fly so that's an American lady that's just come out of a um, chrysalis and then we had a sachem skipper this is ageratum. Ageratum is a great plant for butterfly gardens. It's a little bit of a thug because it spreads willy-nilly in your garden. And I you just let it spread willy-nilly. Um, but all butterflies use it as nectar, a nectar source. So it's a great nectar source. Um, and then there's a leaf skipper over on the other um, ageratum. And then in the fall, um, you'll see we started to grow a little bit more. We've added some branches in there. The branches do both add interest to the garden, but they 
and they support the plants, but they also allow the birds to sit on them or the butterflies to perch on them. So we've put logs and, and um, branches into the gardens. And this is a Maximilian uh, sunflower and it is being held up with the branches and then you have some ageratum down in here. And I think we have some frost aster back in the back. So as you go along, you add more plants. This is a monarch butterfly and it is on cosmos. And cosmos is a plant that's a great nectar plant for gardens. And you actually can buy cosmos seed and just throw it into your garden. And it comes in like heights of 18, 12 to 18 and then 36 to 48. So you can buy different varieties. And here's an orange sulfur butterfly on the cosmos and it's getting nectar off the flower. Here are zinnias. My sister does a lot of zinnias every year. She grows from seed. And so these are some of the zinnias. There's another zinnia and it's with a tiger swallowtail. So you have a tiger swallowtail there. And this is called a common buckeye. And um, we've had several big migrations of common buckeyes. Snapdragons are a great thing in the garden because they are most plant for the common buckeye. So my sister's, one of my sister's favorite plants is snapdragon. So we always have lots of snapdragons in the garden. Um, Beth, why don't you go ahead and kind of explain the difference between the host plant and a nectar plant? Okay, so the, so the host plant is the plant that the butterfly raises its um, baby butterflies on. So a host plant for a monarch would be milkweed, any type of milkweed. Um, a host plant for a common buckeye is um, snapdragons, though it is also several other things. A host plant for a black swallowtail is carrots, rue, dill, parsley. So a nectar plant is anything a butterfly can get nectar out of to feed off of. So they're very different, they have very different um, functions. And so if you plant host plants, you are going to encourage more butterflies to come to your garden and lay eggs. And then you'll have the life cycle of the butterfly in your gardens. And primarily we wanted to have nectar flowers, but we also wanted to have host plants because I like looking at the life cycle of the different butterflies. It's been very exciting. We've had, I don't know, 12 to 15 different life cycles of butterflies in the yard over the years. So the snapdragon, plantain is another, um, I think that's what it's called. It's the plant that you used to snap off and shoot at people when you were a little kid. Anybody ever do that? Had like a head oh, on sure. it and then you snapped it off. That's also a host plant. So anyway, here's a little baby caterpillar. There's a littler one there and you can see there's a number of uh, common buckeye caterpillars in here. There's a larger one over here, but if you look up in here, this is a crab spider. And that crab spider is just waiting to eat one of those two um, caterpillars. So there's a lot of predators and um, that kind of thing. So in 2011, we had five more species of butterflies and I've put the host plants there. So they'll nectar on basically anything in our garden, but the host plants are there for what we have and in red are what we have here that they can eat. So the question mark butterfly, the host plant is hackberry. We had nettles, but nettles are another thug that spread everywhere. So we stopped them. Um, so that's just kind of a, slide of what we're doing. So the next year, this is early May, mid-May, we planted something called catmint. That is the purple flower you see right here. Catmint is an early bloomer. It blooms all summer, but it's a great flower because you can, when it gets all the spent flowers on it, you actually can take your shears, your kitchen shears, your garden shears, and you just cut it off about six inches high it regrows and blooms again in the summertime. 
after the second blooming is done, you take it off and chop it off again and get more blooms the third time. So it's a great prolific bloomer throughout the season. The white flowers are just fever few and they don't honestly have any nectar or really any value, but they're again a flower my sister likes and they're an early spring bloomer. So we have them in the garden, but they don't really do much for anybody. They look pretty. So, and then here's a cabbage white butterfly on catmint and it's nectar and you can see it's um, proboscis is in the tubular area. And then you have a sleepy orange on catnip with its process in the um, tubular area. Another thing that we get in the garden are hummingbirds. So this is a ruby-throated hummingbirds and on the east coast you only get ruby-throated hummingbirds. If you get a different hummingbird it's because it's migrant and it's lost. So this is wild, wild columbine got the first plant, but now we just take the seeds off and we throw the seeds in the garden and let them grow. Um, and you can see he's got a little bit of nectar on his neck up here. Okay, so then we had another delivery of dirt and we expanded this front garden and we made a side garden. We really are gluttons for punishment. So this is the side garden about two months later and it's coming along nicely. This is in the back, we planted some cardinal flower and this is a um, ruby-throated hummingbird, a young female later in the summer. Okay, so this is in September in the front garden where we had just put all that dirt. These cannas we're supposed to be about six foot tall. And I have to tell you, they were as tall as the house. I don't know how, we're four foot up, we're four courses of concrete up, so that's 32 inches. And then however high the house is, it was amazing. And we have marigolds in here, we have lantana in here, we have cosmos in here. We have all kinds of different flowers in there for the butterflies. So are the cannas a host or a nectar? The cannas are actually a host plant. They are a nectar plant, but they're a nectar plant for all butterflies, but something called a Brazilian skipper that nectars or that lays eggs on cannas. And in 2013, they were considered a rare butterfly in New Jersey. And as of 2018, they are now here all summer long. Thanks to you? No, uh, apparently, <laughs> no, thanks to global warning, warming. Up. It's kind of weird because um, they came in 2018 and it seems like they haven't left. So these are the, that's the side garden. And I literally, I deadhead my cannas. So I actually take a long garden pole and use that to cut the flower stalk off so that it can regrow more flowers. I don't know if that's why I had so many um, cannas or not such fall. So this is also mid-September. This plant here, this white one, is called smooth wood aster. Wood aster is a chocolate cake to a butterfly, especially in the fall. They love the nectar from them. They are also a host plant for pearl crescent, but they absolutely love them. This is another shorter one. This is New England aster here. Then you have some lantana, you have some dill back there for the black swallowtails, and you have Mexican sunflower. Mexican sunflower doesn't work for us because we have too many winds and the branches are very um, brittle and they fall off in the winds. So not every, one of the easiest things you all can do is you can put out rotten fruit. So when you have rotten fruit, there are butterflies that only come to rotten fruit and there are butterflies that come to both flowers and rotten fruit. This is a viceroy, it's not a monarch, it's a little smaller than a monarch. And the person who taught me a lot about the gardens was a lady called Pat Sutton who taught classes. And she suggested to everybody in the class that they put out a dish of rotten fruit. So you go to your local farmer's market and you say, do you have any rotten fruit? And they say, sure, what do you want it for? Are you crazy? And you take it home and you put it out on the tray and the butterfly comes and nectars on it. And this happened in 2012. 
And then this happened about a week later. I have to tell you, there are probably, I want to say 50 butterflies on that tray of fruit. It was the most amazing thing I've ever, not the most amazing, but it was an amazing sight. You know, you've got question marks, red admirals, morning cloaks. You have all kinds of butterflies on that tray, nectaring on that fr fruit. Now they don't really eat the nectar. What they're going after is the juice in the fruit. So if I needed to put out more juice, I would just kind of shoo them off and add some more liquid to the tray along with the fruit. A question mark butterfly, one thing Catherine found interesting, a question mark butterfly has a, like a comma with a dot next to it. That makes it a question mark. There is a um, butterfly called the Eastern comma that only has that little comma mark. And they look very similar. You can hardly tell them apart. But if it has a dot, it's a question mark. And if it doesn't, it's a um, comma. Well, and I thought they looked like like dead leaves. Yes, you did think they looked like dead leaves. And, and in fact, they are flying dead leaves. And then one of the butterflies that fly all winter, both Eastern um, commas and Question marks fly all winter. And in fact, I saw one two days ago after we talked. It flew through the yard. Really? Yeah, I couldn't tell which it was because it didn't stop to say hello. <laughs> so here are some more commas. And then there's a, a, a um, common buckeye there. Common buckeye in the wintertime gets more red on the outside. The outside of their butterfly changes a different color, kind of like the birds do when they're. Um, courting the ladies. So this is that fall. In, in September of 2012, there was a, a monarch migration through Cape May that they estimated was over a million monarchs. And they streamed down the dunes and streamed down the dunes and streamed down the dunes and streamed through my yard. And I don't know if you can see them all, but there are just tons of monarchs on this uh, Ageratum here. It was just, it was incredible. And I did go over to Cape May and take pictures too. This was the New England aster. And this is what really, whereas I liked the gardens before, this is what really drew me in. This is what really excited me and said, yeah, I'm going to explore this more. So these were my 2012 new butterfly species, and there were 13 of them. And so I tell you the host plants. And like I said, this is going to be available to you later if you want to look at it. Um, and then in 2013, because I got drawn in, a load of dirt, a bigger load of dirt. <laughs> and so my two sisters came down, and this is my sister Leslie. Again, it was thrown into the front yard. And I rented from rental company a front end loader, and we moved all the dirt. So here's Leslie building up the back center garden and there I am and she's directing me on where to put the dirt because we're building up the berm so that it's higher and so she's telling me what to do and here she is raking out the berm and they helped me that weekend my other sister took a lot of plants out of the ground and put them in pots so that we could replant them the next weekend when we got another load of dirt because they felt we needed another load of dirt they decided they didn't want to come help. So I did everything person that day. So there I am, it was a little cooler, but I built the berm. And it has compacted down over the years. Jenny builds, grows a lot of our flowers from, from seed. She does zinnias and snapdragons, tropical milkweed, agastache. Here's a butterfly that came in the uh, garage and was nectaring on her little plant. This is where we're rebuilding the gardens and we had to rebuild them pretty quickly because we were going to Alaska on a three week Alaska cruise or trip, not a cruise. So here we are, we're just getting ready to leave. And we've got it pretty well planted. And then later on in the summer, the cone flowers came up and cone flowers again are a nectar plant, but they are a host plant. And these are variegated fritillaries. And coneflowers also will feed the birds. If you have birds that come to your yard, 
the seeds in the fall, especially goldfinches will love that. So the fritillaries are a lover of pansies and violets and that's their host plant. And so here you have a, a pansy that we've planted in the spring. And here is one of the caterpillars from the variegated fritillary. Sorry, I wish I had a little forward thing on this that I could hit it and make it go forward. Okay, this is a um, red spotted purple and a red spotted purple is a, the host plant is the cherry tree and it is also um, either takes sap from the cherry tree or takes rotten fruit. And it laid an egg. I had a little cherry tree in a container to plant and it lays the eggs at the tip of the um, leaf of the plant. And I saw it laying eggs, laid about seven eggs on this little tiny cherry tree that was in a pot and it, they hatched and this little tiny thing down here is a caterpillar. It's about as big as a piece of your hair, you know, a quarter inch long, an eighth inch long. It's not very big, um, but it eats and it eats and it eats and it becomes this caterpillar. And this caterpillar is the red spotted purple caterpillar and it is designed to look like poop. So that when a bird looks down and looks at that, it says, Oh, there's nothing down there to eat. So it avoids getting eating that way, eaten. So are those brown things coming out of its mouth, part of its camouflage? Oh, no, no, actually it's coming out of his head. They're more like antenna is what they're like. Oh, okay. Um, but it is it is amazing, I'll tell you. To yeah. The world. So again, these are the front side garden. And this year we don't have red out there. We have yellow and orange out there, different canna. And we have some verbena bonanoresis. I can't say that word, it's down there. <laughs> a wonderful self-seeding plant. I would recommend you get it. Apparently it was from Brazil originally, but it's all over the United States. And it is a very good nectar plant that starts probably in May in my yard and last through November. This is a broad wing skipper. This is the back garden um, that following year. And you, there's some salvia in there, which is a th you throw the seed in and it grows. There's some flocks in there, some Maximilian um, sunflower. So your gardens aren't stagnant. They grow every year and you change things every year. Here's the phlox, and back over here is something called malvia, and malvia is a host plant for the painted lady. And here's a here's a painted lady on um, the cone mm. flower, and here's the malva, um, which is in the mallow family, and that's the host plant. I must admit I've never found one on there. Okay, so 2013 we had another 13 or 14 species. And here are their um, host plants. Like I said, in red are the ones that I have here in the yard. And each year we added more um, host plants so that we could see more of what was going on. Here's lantana, one of my favorite flowers. We have cone flowers in all different colors. And here is some zinnias, which are a great nectar flower. And you have five species or four species of butterflies on that. You have a common checkered skipper, a common buckeye, a sachem, and a fiery skipper. And the skippers, these little brown jobs, are hard to learn. And every year you have to relearn them. So it's like, OK, what is this one this year? So in 14, we had no new butterfly species. And in 15, we had no new butterfly, or we had one new butterfly species. And then this is the summer of 16, I would guess. And then here we have a purple hair streak on purple milkweed. And I don't know, I don't know if you can see the, the egg on this purple milkweed um, or, all the, or all the people are, maybe I could get rid of all these people. Maybe that would help. No, we can see it. Okay. I guess what I'm seeing is I'm seeing all your faces, so I can't see that you're seeing the pictures. 
So that's a little monarch um, egg there on swamp milkweed. This is called butterfly weed. There are probably, oh my gosh, I don't know how many species of milkweed, but we have probably eight different ones in the yard. And here are two monarch caterpillars on the butterfly weed. So they're munching away happily and they will become monarchs. So here's the front side garden again. Must have gone backwards, we're back to red here. But we have blue rhea salvia and blue rhea salvia is another wonderful plant I'd put in your gardens. It brings in all kinds of butterflies. We had Coreopsis in the front. Um, I'm not a fan of Coreopsis, something my sister likes. We had Mexican um, sunflower over here and um, some catmint. I had just apparently cut the catmint back. So in 16 and 17, again, you have all the different species that we had in the yard and their host plants. And then in June of 2017, a great purple hair streak came to my yard. They haven't had a great purple hair streak in my yard in over a hundred years. Excuse me, I'm gonna have a drink of water. I actually, when I saw it, I was out going to take a photography class and I was outside with my wrong camera and I saw it and I knew immediately what it was even though I'd never seen one. And I called to Jenny, my sister, to bring out my good camera so that I could take pictures of it. I had no idea that it was rare. I didn't know that it hadn't been seen in New Jersey in a hundred years. It was an amazing surprise and you won't believe the people that came to my yard over the next couple of days, the butterfly people, to see if it would come back. It only was in the yard for about 20 minutes, as far as I know. Though I will say my sister Jenny, the day before told me there was a big gray butterfly in the yard she had never seen. And I said, oh, Jenny, it's just a gray hair streak. It's not a big deal. So it truly could have been the great purple hair streak and I just poo-pooed her. Always listen to your sister. <laughs> okay, so here's some more blue rhea salvia and here's some lantana and here's an acola skipper. Now I will say I do try to get cute pictures with their proboscis all curled up. This is yarrow. It is also a um, painted lady host plant. I didn't see a lot of butterflies on it. We actually had it last year for the second time and we're pulling it out. This is looking down from above my garage at my back berm and how it's filled out over the years. Um, and in 2017, we had another amazing monarch migration. And so here we have Mexican sage, which is a fantastic flower, especially for those people down, Billy down in Florida, or down in Florida, down in Texas, Mary down in Texas. These Mexican sage brings in everything. So that's um, the butterflies. And here they are on the Mexican sage. And the CMBO, which is the Cape May Bird Observatory, come to my yard to tag the monarchs because I'm too lazy to tag them myself. Yeah, we so have they, those. Go ahead, Mary. We have those. Yeah. Um, and here we have the monarchs in the front yard on the tropical milkweed. And they just were having a feast. They roosted overnight in my house in both the cherry trees and on the leaves of the canna plants. And so they would come around 4.30 in the afternoon and they would take a position and they would stay there for a while and then move around. It was just amazing. It was incredible. Here they are on Lantana, though you can't see them in there so well. Oh, share about the monarchs. You said they, they got dew on their wings yes. overnight. Okay. So when they, when they come, they come and they ro roost overnight. And then during the night, especially in October, November, they get dew on their wings and they can't fly. They're solar pow pow powered and they can't fly with the dew on their wings. So they actually have to wait until the dew is dried by the sun. And so I have pictures of them in the morning looking totally different because of the dew that's on their um, wings. And I think it was probably 9, 9.30 before they actually took off the next day. But it's, it's pretty amazing. And then here's a long-tailed skipper um, 
on Lantana. And this is a Florida, this comes up from Florida. It is not, it's a um, long distance migrant and it co usually comes up in October, though recently it's been coming up in um, September and it's missing one of its tails, but it's a really beautiful butterfly. Okay, so 2018 and 2019, you see the butterfly species we had. And then in 2019, we had a big migration of, of uh, common buckeyes. And so here are the common buck, buckeyes on, oh my gosh, sedum, one of the uh, autumn joy sedum. And they just had a feast. We have a, a American lady or a painted lady in the background, um, but it was well liked. You have predators also. So predator is a bug that wants to eat the other bugs. So we have a little skipper over here, a sachem, and here you have a praying mantis. And this is in September or October. And that praying mantis is getting ready to lay eggs. Now that's actually not a Chinese mantis, that's a Carolina mantis, which is a native mantis. So it's a good mantis. Um, the Chinese are not so good. So I heard that praying mantis can also try to eat hummingbirds. They do actually, they can. That's why we don't like the Chinese mantis. We're ah. prejudiced. Um, Oh, that's beautiful. They, they do um, eat hummingbirds, dragonflies will eat butterflies. It's amazing. So here's Mexican sage. We have smooth aster up here. We have blue rhea salvia. We have some lantana. This is a spice bush we planted, which is a host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. This is um, hyssop. Hyssop is another um, great nectar plant and that's um, common buckeyes on the hyssop. Here are zinnias that Jenny has grown from seed um, with an American lady and some common buckeyes on there. This is called catmint. Catmint is a great pollinator. It's wonderful. It brings in lots of bees, lots of butterflies, um, blooms good bit of the summer can tolerate shade, but loves full sun. And these are gray hair streaks that are on the um, catmint. This is a, the other thing is you'll find butterflies can fly even though they've lost a good part of their body. Like this one has no back wing on this side and he's really worn away on the other sides. He's still flying. This is a lattice we, built to put on coral honeysuckle, native honeysuckle, so that we could have hummingbirds and butterflies on it. And here we have a cloudless sulfur on it, nectaring on the flowers of the, um, the trumpet flowers of the honeysuckle. This is the back gardens on another year, pretty much the same. We have a little bit, the annuals in the front change a little bit. This is looking down the side garden. And these are cannas. We've got seven varieties of cannas. Okay, so here we have another praying mantis. Now this is a Chinese mantis and it has eaten a skipper already. If you see that, that's a fiery skipper. It's currently eating a American lady and this painted lady should be getting out of there because next that's gonna be the mantis's meal. So how do you tell the Chinese from the the American spot, on, spot for, for Chinese from the Carolina. There oh. is a spot on the back of the Carolina mantis that tells you that it's a Carolina mantis and it's a little bit spotted. So, and, and they don't eat butterflies. the butterflies? Oh no, they eat the butterflies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they eat the butterflies, but they're just, uh, they're not invasive like the Chinese mantis is. The oh. Chinese mantis was brought here for to get rid of some kind of pest and then it got out in the wild and it spread and it's you know okay it could be a problem. i think the chinese man uh praying mantis use chopsticks when they eat uh the butterflies oh okay good enough okay <laughs> so so jack wrote that the chinese mantis are available at walmart and they cost less 
<laughs> oh, okay. I'll send them some from down here or up here. So in my, okay, so this is the praying mantis. And then in the yard, I have host flowers, scrubs, scrubs, shrubs, and trees for the butterflies. So I've made a slide that has all the different flowers that we have and they're what that these are host plants for a butterfly. Um, these are shrubs that we have and these are trees that we have that are host plants. So we started small and worked up um, and add things all the time. And this is my spe species count by years. And that is how many each year we've had. So we've had 55 species since 2010. And in 2020, we had a dismal butterfly year and we only had 30, 36 species documented. Whereas the year before we had 45. We had a very bad spring last year. It was very wet. And the butterfly experts don't know if it was because it was very wet that we had less because it knocked out all the spring butterflies or what, but uh, it was a sad year for me. And then hey, these are- it was it was 2020, what can you say? I know, that's absolutely true. It was 2020, what can you say? And these are um, New England Aster along the back fence line with my neighbor. And that's my slideshow. I hope you enjoyed it. Wow, we definitely did. Um, so there are some questions. Okay, shall I stop share now? No, why don't we okay. leave your pictures just because okay. they might- um, okay, that's fine. You know, people might want to see them. So, um, uh, Billy was wondering about: um, Are you irrigating any of any of that of the garden? I do are not you? irrigate any gar of the garden. I do if it is very very dry. About once every two weeks, I will put a sprinkler, an over you know one that rotates back and forth. Um, on each area for about an hour, but that's all I do. I don't have any irrigation. I'm the- And that's because of your climate. Well, it's very dry up here in the summer, but we usually get enough rain that it's okay. And it gives, a lot of my plants are dry, drought tolerant. So I look for drought tolerant plants. Huh. This year we had a problem with rabbits. Rabbits went crazy this year. Huh it was 2020 um but it's the first time we've had a major problem with rabbits in the yard so let's see um okay there, so a couple other questions is you had mentioned that the people would um a university or something would put a chip in the oh, it's okay. So they, the the CMBO, which is the Cape May Bird Observatory, they come over and tag monarchs in my yard for a university. It's um, either University of Wisconsin or Michigan. I don't remember who it is, but it's the Monarch Watch. And they get little tags that are about as big as your baby fingernail. And they have on them a number, a phone number to call, though now they just have the website on there and some other information. And they put them on the back wing of the monarch. And then when the monarch migrates to Mexico, if it is found along the way or seen along the way, it doesn't have to be found, but if you've seen it and taken a picture, you're encouraged to call the monarch monitoring, monitoring I can't say that, program. And they will tell you where the monarch was tagged originally. When they get to Mexico, in Mexico, they actually have a system where if any of the Mexicans find a dead butterfly with a tag on it, if they call, they will get a few pesos back for that information. I will say I was told, I don't know if it's true or not, but I was told that that hasn't worked out so good because sometimes they use a net to catch the tagged monarchs and then they give them the number and get the money and you know, so forth. So they come over when the monarchs are plentiful in the yard, I call them and say, come on over and they come over and tag the monarchs. So I think wow. my part for building the gardens. Yeah, um, here's a question from 
Deborah in South Carolina. She said, where can we get milkweed seed? It's hard to find plants. Is it hard to find plants or seeds in South Carolina? Ignore that phone. Um, <laughs> It should not be. You can go online and Eden Gar Eden's Garden, I believe, is one of the websites. Um, there are a couple websites. If you look for swamp milkweed or um, common milkweed, sometimes your native plant sales. If you look for a native plant sale in your area, um, you can usually fly, you don't want to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or any place like that because they have poisons on the plants that are going to kill the butterflies. The native plant sales, if you look up in your county where your native plant sales are, you can find them. Or there are some that are um, some stores online, garden centers online. Um, if they get in touch with me, I'd be glad to put them in touch with some, pla some uh, places, or if you're gonna post some slides, I could post some uh, places that we recommend that we've gotten plants from that have worked out really well. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that you can go to, one, not Lowe's or Home Depot, but a nice garden center and buy in the spring, it's like a pack of, of um, good bugs for your like um you lady like ladybugs ladybugs and maybe some praying mantis and you know a packet of an assortment what do you, you think you don't really want to do that you want to just let them come to your yard so you want to plant the plants and then let the the bugs come and they will come i mean i have millions of pictures of bees and and um i have probably four thousand more pictures to show you but the pollinators will come when you plant flowers and they will come into the yard. The praying mantis will come into the yard. The ladybugs will come into the yard. They will lay eggs there and um, go through their life cycle in your yard. And you don't have to, if you don't have a big yard, if you're in an apartment, you could do milkweed in a container. You could do uh, swamp milkweed or purple milkweed or some kind of milkweed in a container with a flower nearby, you know, a, a nectar flower. You don't have to have a lot of room. Okay. Um, let's, oh, okay. So this is a question I have. Um, you know how salmon keep going back to where they were born? Yes. Do butterflies do that? I would say probably not because butterfly, the sad part about butterflies is that the butterfly life cycle is not very long. Some butterflies only last two weeks. So they oh. eclose, which is the correct word for coming out of a chrysalis. They close, they fly around, they find a mate, they mate. If it's a female, she finds the host plant, lays her eggs, and she might die in a week. If it's a American lady or a painted lady, they might last, they might live three months, four months. It depends on the butterfly and its life cycle. A monarch's life cycle is probably about six weeks, except for those monarchs that migrate to Mexico. So when they come through my yard, they're supposed to be migrating to Mexico and they're not supposed to be mating anymore. That usually happens, but not always. And they will actually fly from anywhere from Canada all the way down to Mexico, live there all year round. And then in the spring, when the weather signals to them, it's time to go back to the north, they will fly north. They'll mate, fly north and lay eggs in Texas, Louisiana, you know, all the states in the south. They will die, and then the next generation of butterfly will, you know, become a caterpillar, it'll become a chrysalis, it'll, it'll be born, and then it will move up the country up until it finally gets into Canada. So you have varying lengths of butterfly lives is what happens. Okay. Hmm. Um, why don't you 
shop, stop your screen share. Okay. And then um, um, if people want to unmute and ask their own questions, um, Gail Turner, why don't you unmute and share what you just put in the chat? Can you do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's a couple couple of years ago. I live in Phoenix, and a couple of years ago at the Arizona Science Center, um, I saw this fabulous 3D movie about the migration of the, the monarch butterflies mm -hmm. um, Canada to a specific place in um, in Mexico, somewhere near Mexico City. Um, and it did show, I think that there were three different routes. Um, right. And the New, the New Jersey one, of course, is one of those. Where I grew up in, in Iowa, in the tiny, tiny little hometown, um, that I, we were right in the migration route for one of those in uh, the middle of the country. And I can remember, you know, there'd be this morning in the, our parents would wake us up and all, all excited because monarchs are here and everything was just, and like you said, they just sit, they have to sit still because mm -hmm. they can't fly until they dry out. And right. of course they, in Iowa in the summertime, they did get due. And, um, and but it, I mean, literally trees and bushes were just laden with them, just covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, it was incredible. It, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, to see it, it truly is. Over in Cape and, May and Point, the, there are evergreens that are covered with them. Right, and the the business about the milkweed, um, you know, that it's something that we need to promote is to let the milkweed grow wild in you know in the ditches and so on because that's true. Because uh, that is their that is you know what they where they nest or you know, grow their young. So, right. <laughs> yeah, so. Thank you. So make friends, make friends with an Iowa farmer and you'll get the seeds and you, you know, they're, they're doing a lot for, for um, uh, preservation and, you know, the my, ecosystem. My, my neighborhood, I live across the street from the Delaware Bay and they did a, a, a beachfront project a couple of years ago, which I thought was going to be disastrous. They put in a sidewalk for people to walk on. And I thought they were going to wreck the dunes. And they actually put in milkweed, common milkweed along the dunes and beach grasses and some other things. But literally they have common milkweed up and down the dunes and, and they have um, goldenrod up and down the dunes. And so oh. a, a great yeah. thing for the monarchs in the fall, because in the fall, right. they, um, Goldenrod. Right. So here's a question actually from Jack. It says we've been building habitats to attract songbirds, but they eat insects. Is there a natural conflict between attracting birds and attracting butterflies? I don't know of many birds that eat butterflies. They might, but what they really want is the caterpillars. So they want the caterpillars of the butterflies for feeding their young. And it's a cycle of life. So it's important for the birds to be here. And so they need to eat those caterpillars. I watched a program a couple of weeks ago, a chickadee caterpillar or chickadee um, hatchling eats over a thousand ca uh, caterpillars before it's able to fly from the nest. And so that's repeated all over the world. So. If you build it and get caterpillars, they will probably get eaten by prey, but it's part of what happens. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's like you want them to eat those caterpillars that- Like are... the moth caterpillars, because I don't care about the moth caterpillars. Yeah, there you go. Or the ones that really don't turn into pretty butterflies. They just yeah. eat plants. Those yes. are the ones the birds should eat. <laughs> yes, I, I do agree with that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, does anybody else have any questions about gardening or butterfly gardening? I do. Yes, Mary? 
I have a really shady yard. I see that everything you have is sun. Uh -huh. Does anything that attracts butterflies grow in the shade? Or not, uh, not that I very little know. sun. Very, I've not been able to find anything that likes And that's shade. what I thought. Um, they need that solar power and the plants yeah. that are in the shade are mostly ferns and they really don't do much. Well, I have a few flowers that get, you know, they get a, a couple of hours sun a day, but not very much, and some that don't get any sun. Right, I have right. a few things that bloom, but I'm really limited in what, what I can grow. Do you have trees? Is that what the issue is? I've, I'm in a small courtyard, and so I've got walls on every side and two huge trees. Well, one medium-sized and one huge. So take a tree down and put them Oh, no, I can't do that. It's hot in Texas. I need that shade. <laughs> By the, the way, these off. butterflies on my screensaver are uh, from that Mississippi uh, flyway. Right. They're, they're in Dubuque. Right. I, I think I've had that one up before. Um, Mary, does the Dallas Arboretum um, have a butterfly garden in it? Not that I know of per se. Now they do have like that Mexican, um, tell me again. Sage. Mexican the sage. They have some of that in the women's garden and it'll be full of butterflies sometimes uh, during the year. Uh, I'll see that in other plants that they have because they, you know, they have sun. <laughs> Not the Lady Bird Johnson. They, they do have some. Pardon me? The Lady Bird Johnson, I guess, President Johnson's library or something. Yeah, Lady Bird, Bird Johnson. Lady Bird uh, Johnson Wildlife Garden. Yes, something. yeah, I know Texas there too. State. Yeah, down there, uh, right outside of Austin. Okay. okay. Yeah, they they have uh, butterflies too. Yeah. yeah that that the arboretum is, uh, particularly attracts them, but they do have some plants. They have the asters and you know other cannas, other things that that uh, they can feed on. Beth, I might be entirely wrong here, but I thought I heard that you might be moving to Pennsylvania. Is, is I am that... moving to Oxford, Pennsylvania, yes. So how are you going to take your uh, butterfly garden with you? It's very difficult, let me tell you. I will have a, a, a bigger yard. I'm going to have about an acre. So I'm going to be able to plant trees because on the Delaware Bay, the only tree that lives is white pine or black pine. I do have a cherry tree behind my house, a wild cherry tree, but it's basically, there's not much to grow tree-wise along the bay. So I'll be able to plant trees. But unfortunately, my gardens can't go with me. And because I have a triple lot on the bay, I expect that somebody will buy it and put up a McMansion and there will be no gardens anymore. I will be very surprised if they keep the gardens. It will be all ground and building. Sad. Will you be keeping your house um, in, um, are you in North Carolina? No, no, I'm only in, I'm only in North Cape May. So I'm only over in North Cape May and I'm selling the house and moving to Pennsylvania. I've been here, it's time to go up um, to the family of my heart. Because I'm widowed and don't have any children. So. Well, I'm sure that your uh, butterfly garden will uh, increase the value of your property when you go to sell it. So I don't think so. I think these days people in, in the shore towns want to rip the houses down, though I've been told by the real estate agent they probably won't rip the house down. But I don't know. They rip the house down and they build a 4,500 or 5,000 square foot house. And I have a triple lot which is a very rare thing to have. We built the house back in 1985. My husband bought the property in about 77. And I expect that it will be gone and by the next year. You know, it would be nice if, if um, you found out if whoever's gonna buy it doesn't want the plants. I mean, if they are gonna bulldoze it, to put up a sign to let people come take dig up the plants. That's actually a good idea to tell you. The truth. We are going to take plants with us. We already, this was a sudden decision to move in the fall. And we already had plants out that we were going to plant next year. And we take a lot of cuttings and stuff every year. So actually, 
asking them if they would let people take the plants out would be a great idea. A really good idea. Do you, do you still have sisters that live near you? And are they going my, to be my, old, my younger baby sister, she and her husband live with me and we're all going up there together. They moved in here five years ago because truthfully as a widow, I couldn't afford the taxes. My taxes are $13,000 a year and I couldn't afford to retire. I'm a nurse who only made about $40,000 a year, a registered nurse, and I could not afford to retire. So they came to live with me. So I'm house poor is what actually it works out to be. And so um, they are going with me. And then I have an older sister who lives in Pennsylvania and Montgomery County, and she will like it because she will be, it'll be easier to get to from where she lives. That's great. Yeah. Well, Beth, um, thank you so much for doing, putting all of that together for us. It was really fascinating. Not a problem.